participants. Um, and um, we also have trips and classes. You can find all of that at our website, politics-pros.com. Um, before we get started, I want everybody to take out your phones and put it on silent so we're not disrupting it. Um, and when, when we get to the audience Q&A, uh, we have a mic right here um, next to this pillar. It's kind of hiding, but if you could line up at the microphone for the questions and speak into the microphone, because we are um, live streaming this, and it will be on our YouTube channel. Um, and then um, when we get to the signing, you're going to line up right there at the, at the mic and go straight back. Have your books ready so we can get them uh, put sticky notes on it so you can have them personalized. And if you haven't already purchased it, we have plenty of copies back at the registers. Um, and then once we're done, if you could just fold up your chair and put it against something solid, that would be fantastic. Um, so without further ado, we, we are here to celebrate Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya for his highly anticipated debut novel, Chain Gang All-Stars. Um, it has been celebrated with rave reviews across the board. I haven't seen a single, like, if you want, like everything is just like celebrating this thing. It's amazing. Um, and it's already a national bestseller. It was chosen for a Roxanne Gay's May selection for the Audacious Book Club, as well as the May A Read with Jenna Book Club pick. Uh, Nana Kwame is the New York Times bestselling author of Friday Black. He was a National Book Foundation's 5 under 35 honoree, the winner of the Penn Jean Stein Book Award and the Sor uh, Sororian Prize and a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle, Circle's John Leonard Award for the best first book, along with many other honors. Um, his work has appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, Esquire, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. And he was raised in Spring Valley, New York, and now lives in the Bronx. This is his last stop in the US, so we're excited to be able to have him here for this before he heads overseas. Um, so this is his last stop, and then he has a break, and then onward. Um, he, he'll be in conversation. <laughs> yes, what's up? He'll, he'll be in conversation with Clint Smith, uh, staff writer at The Atlantic. Uh, he is the author of the narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, uh, Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, which is also a number one New York Times bestseller. And uh, he also has a poetry collection, Counting Descent, and most recently, Above Ground. So now. Please join, please join me in welcoming Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya and Clint Smith to Politician Tours. Exciting. What's up, man? What's going on? Um, I'm really happy to be alive right now. <laughs> uh, I've been telling everyone how uh, a week ago, I came back from doing 19 flights in 20 days. And it's like, yeah, that look in your face is correct. <laughs> that, and um, it's been wild. And I've been sort of joking about it and saying, like, I keep repeating that to make my publicist feel bad. <laughs> but um, now that I'm finally at the end, I feel like I have to, like, give a moment to be like, I am super grateful, like, extremely grateful. I'm looking over here in my... <laughs> my editor and my agent are here. And yeah, and yeah. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go in in a second, I'm sorry guys. Um, when I first, uh, my first book came out, I was 27 years old and I've been joking about how like, they were like, oh my God, he's 27, he's just 27. And I remember feeling like, they're kind of harping on my age a lot. Um, now I'm 32, and they don't talk about my age at all. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, hmm, I, I'm still on the younger side. But uh, the reason I bring that up is uh, I had just finished MFA at grad school at like 26, and uh, then I was in fellowship. And what else was happening at that time was my father was diagnosed with cancer, diffuse large cell lymphoma. And even before that, I was what you would call a desperate person. <laughs> I really, 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 really want to have a book out in the world. And um, like it was pretty, it was dark. It was very like this or nothing else. And I had written a book when I was 19 and then nothing happened with it. And I had queried agents and the 
cringe line in that query letter to my agent, the agent who I, the agents who I hoped would represent me back then was, if you understood the depth of my resolve, you would drown in it. <laughs> like I sent that to people. <laughs> if you understood the depth. And then I was like, so here's my email, my name, and my number. <laughs> and so uh, years later, I learned to kind of tuck that intensity in, but I still felt it. And so when uh, I queried my agent Meredith, which was a totally a, a, bl a blind curia, a cold query, she didn't know me from a hole in a wall. It was really like, like a wish against, I don't know what, it felt like I'm, I see this name, I, I quickly scanned her Twitter and saw that she was like adequately anti-Trump, but um, <laughs> it also just felt like, okay, this is, this is it. Um, she messaged me back pretty quickly and before we even agreed to work with each other, she had given me more than a, like, a, like a critical reaction to every single one of the stories in my first book. It's a story collection, there's 12 stories in it. And um, that meant a lot to me because it felt like I was banging my head against the wall. This is before Get Out came out. It wasn't like obvious you were allowed to like write that kind of stuff. Um, for people who don't know, the first story in my book it has a conceit that involves white people being killed, you know, whatever, it's a whole thing. But it was a lot. And um, I don't usually rush into decisions like that, but I was feeling like the pressure because um, that diagnosis from my father and we got, uh, she went to work with me and I was like, you know what, let's just do it. And I remember telling my little sister, oh, like, I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna sell this book in like three months um, because I had to. And I didn't tell Meredith that, but um, I remember she's like, okay, we're gonna aim for like this certain day. And then we started going on with the book. And then with my editor, uh, we sent the book to a bunch of people. I feel like people don't know that about like my story. Kind of seems like, oh, the short story collection came out and everyone loved it. No. <laughs> I don't know how many people we sent it to. It's more than 15. I think it's in the 20s. I remember because there was a point where she was like, do you want me to keep telling you when people reject it? Or <laughs> do you want me to like just kind of hold that to myself? But uh, in that process, she never ever once made me think like we should change anything in the book. She never ever made me once feel like something should be, uh, like it was like my fault. She never made me feel like um, I had done something wrong. And again, that meant a lot to me. And then so when I uh, eventually, uh, we, so we sent it out and then we, I, she, Meredith told me that Naomi was gonna call me, who's now my editor. It was on my birthday. My 27th birthday. My 26th birthday? 26th birthday. And um, like that day, my life changed, you know? And it was within that three months. My, from when I told my sister that day, it was like about three months from when it happened. And so uh, I just want to say, like, I've been joking about like a tour being super hard, and it is super hard. And like, I would never wish this much travel on anyone, but like, sometimes you could joke so much, you kind of lose the force for the tree, so to speak, or that is to say, you might start not realizing I'm getting to live like a, a dream I've had because of y'all and obviously because of y'all. And um, I do not take it for granted. It really, it really is something kind of crazy. And uh, sometimes I, like sometimes it's hard to like know where to put some of that intensity that I used to have in the book world. Cause I used to be a very, very competitive person. I don't think that's very healthy in like book space. Cause in fact, I think that we're on the same team all trying to save the world. But what I do feel something, when I want to get to that energy, I, I think like I would like to make uh, Meredith and Naomi feel like very correct in making that decision. You know, I would like to um, make them feel like they really did the right thing and the other people were wrong, but less than that, <laughs> more that they were really right. And people often say about that, like, you know, one yes can uh, erase 100 no's, and because of y'all two, I've actually felt that in real life. I know that to be true. Um, two yeses got me on 19 flights in 20 days, a couple years later, having me here in DC with all you beautiful people. 
and the Today Show, and the New York Times, <laughs> and the Book Club, and, and, and. Yeah. 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 But I, it's important to say, like, anytime, like, it's, it's not if it's, for me, it's for y'all, too. And I hope you guys feel that really deeply, uh, because I mean it really deeply. And, yeah, okay, that's like that. Thank you, guys. That's not my normal opening thing. I have to change it up for today. I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to read, I'm going to read just the first page. I, I'm going to read just a little bit, and maybe we just talk about it. I have a whole thing, but I feel like we should just get into it. I'm going to read from the beginning that we call the beginning, not the prologue, because I canvassed Twitter and asked them. When you guys see prologue, you definitely read it, right? <laughs> the results were varied at best. Thank you. You should. No pressure. I'm not trying to judge, but for those people who do not read the prologue, um, when you listen to music, do you start the song like 37 seconds in? Or, <laughs> you know, I don't. I'm just trying to figure out the... This book is about an imagined future in which convicted wards of state can opt out of a sentence of at least 25 years and participate in death matches. Um, if I was a woman named Loretta Thurward, I'm going to read just a tiny bit to give you guys the tone, and then we could talk. The first chapter, the not prologue, it's called The Freeing of Melancholia Bishop. She felt their eyes, all those executioners. Welcome, young lady, said Mickey Wright, the premier announcer for Chain Gang All-Stars, the crown jewel in the criminal action penal entertainment program. Why don't you tell us your name? His high boots were planted in the turf of the battleground, which was long and green, stroked with cocaine white hash marks like a divergent football field. It was Super Bowl weekend, a fact that Wright was contractually obligated to mention between every match that evening. You know my name. She noticed her own steadiness and felt a dim love for herself. Strange. She counted herself wretched for so long, but the crowd seemed to appreciate her boldness. They cheered, though their support was edged with a brutal irony. They looked down on this black woman Dressed in the gray jumpsuit of the incarcerated, she was tall and strong. They looked down on her and the tight cords of black hair on her head. They looked down gleefully. She was about to die. They believed this the way they believed in the sun and the moon and the air they breathed. All right, I'll just stop there for now. Thank you guys so much. You answered like seven of my questions <laughs> in that beautiful tribute to your Asian editor. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, it's, I think it's super important, right? Like, and I'm, I'm glad you started there um, because I think that for folks on the outside, the process can feel very um, opaque. The process can feel all they see is the triumph, right? All they see is the profile in Vulture. All they see is the thing in the New York Times. All they see is you on the Today Show. Yeah. And, and we were talking a little bit backstage about how there's so much that precedes that and that there's so many people involved in that. And, and one of the first questions, you know, we started, this is just going to be a continuation of the conversation we yeah. had backstage, but like you, you study with George Saunders. <clears throat> yeah. One of the OGs, f fiction, short stories. And I'm, I'm interested in this idea of like literary lineage. And I'm interested in the role that mentors play in shaping how we, make sense of who we are as writers. So I'm, I'll be curious to hear more about how George shaped who you are as a writer and what other lineages mm. you feel like you're a part of that shape your work. It's a really important and good question. And I'm also interested in like literary lineages. It's, um, it's like a f powerful and useful thing to think about how you get to be where you are and like who sort of came before you. Um, my The story with George... Um, if I had to name like one other person or maybe two other people besides the people I just named, uh, he would definitely be in that group of people who are why I got to, I'm speaking to y'all right now. I was in um, college when I first got introduced to him. I was working with a woman named Lynn Tillman. She was just giving me stories. And uh, I remember when she, the week she gave me a, a George Saunders story called Winky, I was like, kind of like, what the hell is this? 
you know he he writes like weird if you don't know i don't know and uh but also he's like he's not like uh he throws you right into a meaningful action right in the beginning and it's very particular lexicon and particular language and he asks you to learn by doing as opposed to like taking the time to sort of teach you it, which i have like really adopted in terms of my own style um like he doesn't baby you but the what was really important was like he he showed me that there was like sort of complexity and humor that you could have even while talking about really a lot of harshness and violence that felt really attractive to me at the time um and then eventually she kept giving me because at first i was like i don't know if i like this but i kind of like i'm interested she gave me another one another one i got to the story sea oak from pastoralia and i was living me and my family were living in a basement in spring valley rock and county that used to flood it was like this terrible physical space and um i remember reading sea oak in that basement and it like changed my like sh shifted my perception like i was like able to laugh at this like sort of not only terrible circumstance, but the circumstance that had become like my primary motivator. I was very much like, I'm going to get everyone out of this thing. That was part of that like depth of my resolve was part of that was like trying to change the situation. And um, so he was already like this North Star for that reason, because he showed me like, oh, I, like in my own life, I can laugh at this thing that is actually killing me. Then um, he came to my college and I, I remember going to the I knew he was coming. It's when 10th of December was coming out. I was an undergrad at SUNY Albany, SUNY Albany gang. And um, he, um, I remember going to the, the bookstore. I had money for like, I had to go with a textbook. And I had money, like I probably had like $52 around like three accounts, you know? And I had money for either 10th of December or like whatever communications book. And I remember walking out with 10th of December feeling like this is the right decision. <laughs> and when he came, he did his talk. He always talks about how this like, Six, six people out of 600 good children for the MFA is like impossible. And I remember feeling grateful because I was like, at least when I don't get accepted, kind of already applied, it's because of um, the numbers were impossible. Somehow I got accepted. I still kind of assumed there's some kind of clerical error. And um, he ended up being way better than I could have imagined. He was extremely kind. He's um, extremely knowledgeable, but he also, I, I think really the way he carries himself, everyone says he's the nicest, coolest, whatever, but he really moves with like a sort of grace towards everyone and compassion, really. And I think seeing that as a person I look up to, probably the person in the literary world I looked up to the most, and eventually getting to work with him, he was my thesis advisor, he's the first person to read my first book, and having him edit me really like closely, um, he's given me like a ton. So with George, it's, it's this more specific things I could talk about, which is not being afraid of going to like harshness, believing that every moral ethical problem can be solved on the line level, um, working towards like having a practice in your life that can like can bleed into your fic work, and also believing that we can this whole thing is salvageable. I think those are some of the things that I've gotten from him. And then in terms of other people, um, I work with a guy named Arthur Flowers. Arthur Flowers, and I, even recently I discovered he's, he was taught by John O'Killens, who was taught by Langston Hughes. And so like just really, you could see how quickly you can have this like really like legendary lineage. Um, and even with George is, the people who taught George Tobias Wolf and stuff like this, there's a lot of, you know, and who taught him and it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to think about it. But um, I'm very grateful to so many of my mentors, whether it's Lynn Tillman, George Saunders, Arthur Flowers, Dana Spiota, Bruce Smith. There's a bunch of them. And I really try, similarly to how I try to make it seem like uh, Naomi and Meredith were really right. Part of one of the things I try to rest in is like, I want to make those people proud. Extending this sort of conversation around like craft, it, Talk to us, you kind of burst onto the scene, you know, 27 years old um, with Friday Black. It got all this recognition. You know, we were talking back there about just how how unexpected so much of it felt, um, the sort of wonder. You know, I think both of us in different ways have experienced this feeling of, of like having books that have suddenly catapulted us into spaces and conversations with people who like 
ex felt like they existed in different literary stratospheres yeah. than we did, um, and how sort of remarkable and incredible and surreal that is. I'm I'm interested, you know. So you made this transition from the short story to the novel, but I've also heard you talk about how you started this novel before you started these, those short stories. How do you think about, like, when you are beginning a story, are you clear that, like, this is going to be a short story, this is going to be a novel? I'm interested in the sort of, the evolution of a piece of writing from mm. its genesis to whether, to you, and how you think about what sort of form it should take on. It's a really good question, and, and now, like, the idea has even grown for me as I'm starting to think about other mediums, whether it be photography or music or whatever. But don't you like you like directed music videos or something? Yeah, like that? yeah. I've been playing around with that, so I'm interested in that space as well. But as a writer, especially as pros, if I can make it a short story, I will. That's like my attitude. Like I really fought, like value um, concision, and as you said with Chain Gang, I tried. <laughs> like there's a short story called Chain Gang All Stars. Um, it's not finished, but it's and it's not good either. But it's like uh, an attempt. And it's just, I think as I started, most short stories are going to get, at least for mine, you're going to get like this tip of the iceberg feeling, which I really love. But um, when I was doing Chain Gang, it was sort of like the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And I felt like I was willing to explore it more. And not even I was willing, the, character, the characters were still speaking in my mind. And that's how I really do it. Like I have a ton of ideas always. It's the ones that kind of like win and uh the chain gang all-star stuff in third war they just wouldn't um stop so eventually you sort of have to almost just like bow to them and that's for, for me that's how it was and i tried to do a short story just wasn't it didn't really do much but a lot of that had to do with just starting to once i dipped my toe into doing research about the carceral state once i kind of understood that her situation was intertwined with prison and i started thinking about the carceral state, it ended up becoming like, oh yeah, I have, this is way more than a, than a, um, what I can fit in a short story. And I, and that's important to say because I'm maybe, obviously like one of the people who definitely don't subscribe to the idea of like a novel being superior to a short story collection. In some ways I almost resent the fact that I, my second book is like, I don't resent it, but it's like. Cause that's almost the narrative <laughs> around it. Like, oh, you start with your short story collection and then you, you like graduate to the novel. Exactly, and I'm like, no, I graduated the first time around. Like, <laughs> that was a graduation. Now this is just another thing. Um, and my next book is probably going to be a short story collection. I really don't have, the, I think literary world has a lot of really ridiculous hierarchies that to me mean nothing. And, um, but yeah, it was, uh, if I can do a short story, I will. And it's really about um, if I feel satisfied with, uh, character having ability to grow or change or shift in any way that's usually what i'm looking for and for changing it felt like uh she needed a lot more room and then we as a reader also needed a lot more room to understand her context do you know from the beginning where the character is going to go like i know some folks who sit down with their novel their piece of fiction and they're like all right this is the beginning this is the end and now I got to figure out how we get from the beginning to the end. I know some people who are like, I know as much <laughs> as is on the page, right? And that the process of writing is the process of, of thinking and excavating. Like for you, where on that spectrum do you fall? I was much more the second one. And I kind of took this like artistly pride. People who have the, are the second one, I think they always like let you know they're that type. Like I'm discovering on the page. Because <laughs> it sounds cooler. But it's also true for me. But that's a lot. That's a lot more uh, sustainable, in my opinion, in the short form. With the novel, I, you could be four years in, 150 pages in, and like you kind of think like maybe you should have an idea of where it's happening next, because um, you got deadlines or whatnot. It's like it gets scary. Um, and with the novel, I was the way I've been describing is like swimming with no shore in sight. I feel like I need to connect with John Moore. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna try my best to. Oh, what's going on? I'm gonna try my best to like do that. Um, you have to ch with the novel. It's like um, I just feel like I was swimming with no shore in sight for a really long time. What I what happened with me is uh, the first book happened. I I did a two book deal, so I was already going. I was already working on 
Chain Gang, but like I was like contractually obligated as well. You knew the second book was gonna be Chain Gang. I had it started already. Okay. Like I read even even in novel form. Um. And. I I, Arthur Flowers for example was like you should use an outline it will save you years. And the first time he told me that I was like whatever that's for the other people. And then a couple of years later I was like you know what. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, send me that outline format you had again. Like, <laughs> he emailed me that, and then I like was canvassing a bunch of people. Ingrid Rojas Concheras gave me like a bunch of like outliney styles. She had me like, she's like, whatever you know right now, put it into a poem. She has a lot of like cool, interesting things to think about, and um, so I went. I tried to do that. Uh, I eventually did get an outline. I didn't know the end though, but I had like a sense of like, let's say I was halfway through. I had a sense of like the next like four major movements and like the end was blank. Even though I think maybe part of me knew the end, but I just was scared to admit it. So both. At first I had a sort of ego <laughs> egocentric ad like adhesion to like that I have no outline, I don't know the end at all. And eventually it changed. And I think for me, every story is different is what I really realized. And the what kind of type of writer I am, a lot of times the stories I work on will be like, you can't use the tricks you using that last one for me. You you mentioned how this project was, um, like in the process of writing it, you recognized that incarceration was becoming a central theme. And I've heard you talk about in interviews how you were writing this book in part to figure out if you were an abolitionist, where you, what you, how you were making sense of this sort of phenomenon of, of mass incarceration. And I'm curious about uh, the choice, like, did you always know that, like, f fiction or that the novel was the space in which you would be wrestling with those questions? Because, I mean, for me, because I, I listen to you say that, and I'm, I resonate with it, because for me, writing is the process of thinking. I, like, I actually don't know what I think most of the time until I sit down to write it. And, and that's why, like, I was never good at, like, pitching stories even like even for my day job like they're like what do you want i'm like i don't know like yeah. this thing sounds in like i've been yeah. writing this thing about um uncle tom's cabin i was like i'm gonna like reread uncle tom's cabin and i'm gonna like is it a good novel no does it matter <laughs> does, i don't know right so like and it began there and then like, six months later it's a completely different thing because yeah. the process of writing it has revealed to me that i'm actually interested in a different but related question but i didn't know until i started sitting down to write and so when you mm. sat down to write, was it like, I am writing to make sense of how, of whether I'm an abolitionist, yeah. or did that reveal itself later in the process? It absolutely revealed itself. And I, I the, the what you described, I think a lot of the writers I like really like fuck or like, um, yes. I guess I fuck I feel with. like this is an uncensored space. A lot of the writers I fuck with, um, they do what you just said. Like, it's not interesting if you just go in uh, knowing you're trying to do this, and it feels a little false. I think what I was trying to do really was, I was trying to write a story, <laughs> you know? But then it required me to figure, learn about this space. But then, if I'm gonna, if I was gonna fully empathize and embody this character in this space, and get her to a place where, or, or at least consider how she loves herself and how this, the oppressive state doesn't love her. It was going to force me to think about the con the con the carceral state at large, and so it was absolutely like sort of a discovery. But even even with what the way I, when I say I was writing, hoping I was an abolitionist, that's that's true in the sort of like that's like a uh, digestible surface way of me saying that. But really, what what does that even mean when I say that? It's like I'm sort of asking, do I think like life is sacred no matter what? And that's like a even more unknowable, more like, you know, there's a lot more in that. Do I think that um, really ends up getting to, do I think that I can love myself un unconditionally? Like me, myself, this, that's what it ends up being. And through the revision and all these processes and doing therapy, it's all these things like you realize, you discover the questions. I think that when you're writing, you, you discover like what are the high level questions you can ask. And it's probably something that I can't even exactly articulate. It's even deeper than that. Like what are the barriers to loving yourself institutionally, but also on a societal level, but also like internally. And that feels to me very connected to the question of abolition, even though that to some that might feel very distant. So I'm not only discovering that 
particular question, but I'm also like really unbraiding what that question even means to me, which is many, many, many things on a personal level and like a more a grander, a grander scale. Yeah. And to get into the specificity of the book, like, did you, did you know one of the one of the best parts of it for me? And I'm curious if this was in the original conception of the idea was was the the fact that it was a television show, right? And so, because I can imagine a version of this that's happening without yeah. the the presence. What do you call the little cameras that are flying around? HMCs. The HMCs, like that added such a different dynamic and like such a like a, a complex like textured layer to the story because then it became this thing that was like also a performance and it's like who's performing who's performing for who um where you the, one of the most effective things was when i forget their names i have my notes but the the two characters the boyfriend and will the girlfriend, and emily yeah, yeah and like and they're they're watching it and the way that will talks about it like it's fantasy football yeah and emily's like I really love my boyfriend. This is kind of weird that we're like watching people kill each other, but like I guess I could get into it, but like it's <clears throat> that added that for me that like made it that took it to another level. Yeah. Um and and that's one of the things I loved about it. And I'm curious how you how you thought about introducing that element to it. Was that always a part of it? Did that come later? Um yeah, yeah if you could just say more about that. So, for me I'm really interested in like uh or most of my work, when I get it to the place that I need to, because sometimes I don't realize it in time, I'm interested in like sort of uh, implicating myself in some way, or the reader, but often starting with myself. And if the book Chain Gang, also, this book had like just the sort of Chain Gang All Stars aspect in turn, it, it would make the, it might implicitly make the reader, like the reader's sort of process be judging just these people. In the on the links that are that consider those links, the people who are in the deathmatch sport, um, because when you're reading, no matter what, you're judging people, anyways. And that felt like wrong to me because that's sort of what I'm like trying to like pull back from. Um, because I, I, in so many ways, I'm saying like you have all these big feelings about what's right and wrong, but look how you sit comfortably as people are being murdered right next to you. Um, and so pulling back out to the consumer. It just felt very important because I also, I mean, also to me as like a, I think the, my like readerly eye feels curious because some, even though I don't, some people might say like, this would never happen. And then I have to be like, let me show you how it would happen as opposed to like, like this, let me show you how someone reasonable might um, be coerced or persuaded into like rocking with something this terrible to our mind's eye. Um, because... I'm really interested in how like the, the the flavors of violence we're willing to accept. I was in Boise, Idaho recently, which is like just an interesting thing that I can say is true. <laughs> I was in Boise, Idaho. Have you guys been to Boise, Idaho? <laughs> it's a whole place. Um, but they told me, I mean, they, there's a lot of like shocking things happening there, like um, legally, and they uh, <laughs> one of the ones that's like sort of terrifying, I guess, is um, they just like brought back uh, the firing squad. I know it was like gasp. And uh, they've, it, probably, it will never happen, but like it's on the table, I don't know why, probably some weird crazy reason, but they've like brought that back to being like on the table, or at least they're talking about it. But, but um, this feels like a, that's a gasp for us, right? But if I say like, they have capital punishment, it's like, mm. And so we have this like, we have this thing where we're very comfortable with like certain flavors of murder being like way beyond us. We would never, but oh, like you're killing them with like a cocktail of lethal injections that many nations don't even, don't want to even sell to America. Like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> but like a gun, <laughs> a firing, it's like this weird, we have this thing. And so I, 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 I'm really interested in that. I think and I have a question. I was, I've been thinking about a question because um, I, I wonder how like, being both a historian and a poet, like how these inform and work with each other, because I think, uh, I don't know, euphemism and it can be a really great violence, and being and and having this like tailoring, like sort of a comfortable destruction, uh, at least for the masses to consume, is like something that is already happening. Because like I said, like we're our response to the firing squad is totally, I mean, with with good reason, but. 
that none of that intensity exists for just capital punishment. And that is really interesting to me. And one of the things you do in the book is is reveal, you know, because the, the, the idea of the book is like, wow, look, look at this wild dystopian. You know, I've heard folks, um, Jenna was talking about like the Hunger Games and and it's like, man, can we imagine this ever happening? And one of the things that you do throughout the text is say, you know, you, and predominantly you do it through your footnotes and you're like, you think this is so wild? Actually, like this, let me give you this nonfiction empirical footnote that demonstrates that this thing that feels so far fetched is actually adjacent to or directly informed by something that's already happening. And you do it also in the way that you name certain places, like certain, like you, um, uh, you talk about like when you're talking about the private prison uh, organizations, they're like very adjacent to the like names CCNA of real. CCNA instead yeah. of like CCA, CCA and, yeah, uh, and Geo Group and, and and like, and then you have the uh, uh, a line after Angola, yeah. Um, and so so can you talk more about the decision to incorporate those footnotes? Why you wanted to make more explicit the relationship between that yeah. which exists in front of us in the, in the real world and what also exists in your fictional novel. Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot because um, what I don't know what, because the idea of having a footnote in a book to me is really like terrifying and like not my ideal reading experience. I, I really came up with the idea that you never want to break the fictive dream that feels really important to me, like never try to disrupt. And the footnotes sort of necessarily mechanically do that by making you lose your place and come back down. But... On one level, I, it's almost like I'm trying to do like this high level, like high high wire act, I guess, because I want to be able to do that, but say I'm almost breaking my core tenant in a way that feels useful and actually doesn't disrupt. So just on a formal level, why I found it acceptable. But in terms of why, I didn't want them to be able to like ever present this book as, it's about a woman who kills people with a hammer. I, I've been sort of, I was, Twitter, which is just, I guess, a bad place for me. I'm sort of <laughs> listening to myself. After six, six, the show Succession just ended, I'm not going to spoil it. But you're a Succession skeptic. Oh, big time. Yeah, you, I remember seeing. But I don't hate like, the show. I hate how people read the show. Interesting. I know many people who watch that whole show and were like, their the primary stakes for them is whether or not Kendall Roy gets to be a CEO. Hmm. And I'm like, no. Hmm. In some ways, him getting CEO would be another death penalty for him, or like it would be an indictment for him. They, they, they're viewing it, they're bought into the stakes that he has bought into, even though those same stakes that he has bought into are destroyed his whole life, over, obviously. Because in America, like, moral good equals win. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it's about who won, not about what was right. It's about, even if the just the episode before, the person, it's like, so I, I really want it to be impossible for someone to like succession this book, to be like, to misread it so egregiously, in my opinion. Because I actually think the, that show is about that. Mm. I think that there's a lot of, when you try to work in what you might call satire or like something in those contexts, there's a potential, like the, the danger of it is that uh, a misreading will have someone get the almost exact opposite of what you're trying to do from it. So you might, almost just recreate what you want to dismantle. Um, another example I have is like, that I've been talking about like in Squid Game, I know someone who watched Squid Game and they watch it for like, who's gonna survive and never ever thought about capitalism once. Mm. I know. <laughs> and that's like terrifying to me. Mm. I, I wouldn't be okay with that. Mm. And so even if like, to my old like core tenant, like it's a, we, uh, I would, this is a lesser book because of footnotes and I don't think it is. I think they actually end up, we found a way to, make them really, really work. And also thanks to my editor, we like reeled them in. There was way more before. Um, it was like, here's a mug. Who made that mug? Well, da -da 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 -da. that was like me and, uh, <laughs> and like just exposition of like nature in my book. It was like, people were like, man, your like descriptions are so beautiful. And I was like, in the original draft, there was like four pages about what the tree looked like. And my editor had to be like, I see that you're enamored with this tree, Clint. Like maybe we can have like, yeah. Three sentences yeah. rather than four pages. I feel like so after a while, when you're when you're in it for long enough, you start getting to like, I don't know, like I, I play video games, it's like The Witcher or something, where like there's a book in the in, in it's, it's a book you might never see in you might never touch in the game, but the book is a full book yeah. in the game. You know, I'm like, I want you to know, like this mug is, but you have to kind of like think about where like the heart is, like where is the energy. 
but yeah, so I I wanted it to um, be impossible to read this book and be like, it's just this action packed blah blah blah. And no, I wanted to be explicitly uh, reminded that this is about a evil modern system that we are enabling sort of every day. So this will be my last question, then we'll open it up to, to folks. Um, building on that, <clears throat> I'm interested in like, and, and I'm thinking about this because I've been reading and thinking about Uncle Tom's Cabin. <clears throat> the smoke, man, it's wild. Um, and thinking about, and, and I read, uh, reread James Baldwin's essay, uh, everybody's protest novel of where he criticizes Uncle Tom's Cabin and criticizes yeah. Native Son. And part of what he talks about is like how these books are just pamphlets disguised as novels and that yeah. the characters are two dimensional, they're caricatures, they're flat, they're yeah. like not he went in on human. Them. He went in. <laughs> in ways that he later regretted. He was like, If I you guys haven't lie. read that's pretty intense. Nah, he was he he went in. Um and then Richard Wright was like, I don't fuck with you forever. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, but but it's interesting, right? Because it it's making me it makes me think a lot about how you bring like a a deep set of ideological commitments and values and a justice oriented sensibility as a as a writer to a text that is attempting to tackle said issues and 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 make and wrestle with them. How do you? maintain those values, commitments, and sensibilities while also not falling into the trap yeah. that Baldwin talks about in terms of making the, the characters flip. just uh, sort of pawns, political pawns, to your ideological ends? Well, the answer is like, and it's a really, really important question for me, is I've made a pamphlet before, a literal one. I don't know if y'all know the story about in SUNY Albany. Um, me and after, we were in, I was in college and Trayvon Martin was murdered. And I was like deeply affected. And I think like many people at the time, you had have sort of this awakening moment where like a sort of casual cynicism of the justice system becomes something really different. Um, and I remember being like, you know what? Like I'm gonna just do this. And me and my my best friend, Junior, uh, we made this like pamphlet. I did like the words and he made these pictures. And it was very much that on the hill. Um, this is why you don't get it this is why nothing will change thing. And we woke up at like 3 a.m. and we gave them all, we threw them all over the campus. And um, I went to bed thinking like, well, you know, fixed racism today. Like, <laughs> good job, Nana. And um, I woke up thinking like there's gonna be some like new world order and you know, something crazy would happen. And maybe unsurprisingly, nothing happened. We had just pretty much littered. <laughs> and um, I remember not feeling good about that. <laughs> um, and so with fiction in general, even with the very first story in my first book, I think I was taking another crack at that idea, but it becomes, there's a very easy place. Racism, bad, right? That's not complicated. For me as a writer, I'm usually trying to get to like a complicated place. When so that first story, it's like, okay, if, I, if, I, if we're not gonna meet violence with violence, then what are we gonna do? An example I could give is one I'm thinking about now. George, I sent George a, a thing about this. Uh, I was gonna, I'm gonna think I'm gonna write a story about guns, about guns in quotes. And I mean, I, I feel like it's weird to even talk about a story early, but um, it's, about a, it, it's about a world where you get your first gun like age 12 or something, 13, maybe 14. And the first, first drafts of it, I feel like we're kind of like me dunking on the gun people, on the gun, quote unquote, gun people, and being like, y'all are so dumb. I'm so smart. Look how much you're killing everybody. And I sent it to George, and he said something like, I think it was really important. And it's, it applies to Chang Gang, too, but this is a more condensed version. He's like, when the reader, the writer, and the um, protagonist all just agree on an issue, sort of what's the point? So to me, a higher of the version of that story, even as difficult and pain it is for me to do it, and maybe like how much of it might bruise my ego is to like go to a place, okay, those, the people who like rest in the gun stuff or whatever, they're deeply afraid of something, right? And now I can start working, I could work with that. Like that's a, that's a more, first off, it's a, just a more generous place. And it's not that easy, NRA, y'all suck. And mind you, like, granted, like that, maybe that's how Nana feels in most of his lived life. But the cool part about fiction, I think, is that I get to revisit these moments again and again and again and again and get to like get to like a, a sort of ethical, moral, 
soul place that I kind of can't reach in my regular life. Because in my regular life, it's like, what, fuck me? Fuck you. <laughs> but in fiction, it's like, okay, fuck me. All right. Like, you emerge from a context. But, uh, but in an interesting way, you know? So, like, I think that uh, by actually challenging myself in a real way, because, like I said, the abolitionist thing is, like, sort of the... Sh- because there is a version of the book where it's like, um, prison bad, everyone, but that that's just not, to me, that's not interesting. It's not interesting to just be like, I think I'm right, prison is bad, y'all are all stupid. It's boring, it's not interesting, and it doesn't represent how I feel. Because again, like it's a, we all emerge from this context that the carceral state is in the water. We all have drink it in. We all, don't, we, we all have to work to imagine a world without it, and I know I do, and so, by implicating myself, by really like remembering that like I am also growing, by knowing that I don't have all the answers just like that, I kind of have an opportunity to sort of represent like a true actual growth in the fiction. And I think sometimes that comes across, or use hopefully it does. It's not always the case, but I I hope so. And that's how I feel like for me. But what about for you? I was like I wonder because I feel like you you're right in that same space. Yeah. So how how does it work um for you, especially when I feel like you're armed with because doing some research really grew my like, after a while it did get like, I know we need abolition. I felt that way anyways. And having like done work to like know the history, it feels like you, how do you stay in that place of real discovery and not sort of reduce it to like the pamphlet as you use? I think I always try to keep my work in that context very like inquiry based um, in part because I think it's, a more effective literary strategy, but also because it just is more on more, it's an honest reflection of like my disposition and who I am, right? So when I started How the Word is Passed, I didn't begin that book as an expert on the history of slavery. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like I know everything there is to know about slavery and like let me tell all of you. It was, I am the descendant of enslaved people. My grandfather's grandfather was enslaved. I grew up in New Orleans, which was the heart of the domestic slave trade at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And I still recognize that I don't understand the history of slavery in any way that's commensurate with the impact and legacy that it's left on my city, on my state, and my country. So I could never write a book that's like, here are the 10 things you should have always known about slavery. Because <laughs> I didn't know, yeah. right? Because like, that would have been dishonest. And so part of what I wanted to do was like, I wanted to go on a journey to try to make sense of this question and make sense of this history for me and then hopefully invite the reader on that mm. journey with me so that it feels like they're a partner in the sort of uncovering yeah. of a history that they might not have been cognizant of in the same way that I wasn't cognizant of. And and so I think that, and you mentioned this, right? Like it's a sort of, the sort of honesty with the reader, a vulnerability, a humility um, that I think allows people to, to to step into a story or to step into a piece of nonfiction, to step into a poem, whatever the case may be, without feeling as if they're being judged for what they don't know um, or judged for any sort of previous um, beliefs or convictions that, that they might have had. I, I guess I, I try my best to create a space that extends generosity to people in the same way that generosity Yo. has been extended to me. Because um, there are people who extended generosity to me through their writing, through the conversations, even when they didn't need to. Um, and mm. when they didn't have to, and and I, to the best of my ability, try to try to reflect that um, in my work. And sometimes I'm successful, and sometimes I'm not. But but I think you know, even with this new project I'm working on about World War II, it's it's born out of the fact that I was like, man, all I really know about World War II is like Saving Private Ryan and Tom Hanks' really <laughs> soothing voice. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was like the yeah. story of World War II is so much more vast, so much more complicated. And so, you know, I'm going to spend the next however many years, like, traveling around the world, trying to go to these different World War II sites to make sense of what this history is. And the book will be an invitation for readers to, like, go on that journey alongside me. Mm. I love it. If you all have questions for him, not me, um, <laughs> then you should come I mean, up to the microphone um, and, uh, and let them have it. Oh, the mic's, yeah, the mic's over there. I didn't even peep it. Uh, wonderful conversation. I, I'm curious about your poetry. You mentioned conciseness earlier, and, you know, and, and sort of the short story as your 
preferred choice, but, but you have a book of poetry, I'm wondering, you know, I'd love to invite you to send some poems to us at the Beltway Poetry Quarterly. M me, poems? Yeah. yeah. I'm the one. Oh, you <laughs> write poems. Oh, I miss, I miss, I miss him. He's a poet at heart. Poet at I heart. mean, who knows? I might get a book of poetry. All right. I do not. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah. But anyway, but uh, could you talk about concise, concise and why the short story as opposed to the novel? You know? Yeah. A little well, bit more. Thanks. Well, I don't... I, I've learned so much from poets. I think, like, I I had a uh, when I was in in grad school, I I took a bunch of poetry classes, and I learned a bunch from people like Bruce Smith and Mary Carr and Chris Kennedy and so many other writers. And I think that poets, I don't know, in some in some ways, I think all writers kind of look at poets like they're the ones like really really doing the thing. And um, what that is to me is have. I think in in a lot of ways, part of what I think marks a great writer is like their like the acuteness of their awareness, how willing, how acutely they're willing to make decisions and care, and poets do that on the syllable level. Sometimes they do it just on the white space level, like they they're caring about like how the word arrives physically on the page before he maybe even made a sound, and that level of care, to me, if you can sustain that, always makes the work better. So I try my best to not only care about like the meaning of the words, but the sound of the words. I remember Bruce Smith uh, in Syracuse. My very first class in Syracuse was music as a metaphor. He's like my whole. He's like your whole name is iambic pentameter. He's like na na kwami aj brenya, and I remember feeling like that's so cool. Like not so much that like that is a fact, but that they were talking about that in the class. Because I I had come from a world that I was not. No one ever had. I had never thought about that once, um, and so. To, and then, then now, by now, now I'm into music and all these other things where that's the whole game. You know, how can you make sound and how can you like almost have a enforce or diminish or reinforce your meaning via the sonics of like whatever your word, your word choice. And so um, to me, poets teach me how to do that. And so it's why I'm super interested in them and uh, why who knows, maybe one day at the Poetry Collection. All right. Thank you so much. I can only hope so. Wonderful. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Um, hey. I loved this book so much. It was Thank just, so I can't much. tell you. Um, I brought a lot of people with me because I just love this book so much. Um, and Thanks for coming. I, um, as soon as I finished it, um, I put it down and I was shook, like I'm sure a lot of people were. And I just thought, my first thought was, this was such an ambitious book. Like it was... Every part, but as, as when I ended it, I really, like, it was so clear what you were doing, and it was so thoughtful, like, literally every single part of it, and so I was just really inspired by it, and, I, like, I'm yes. working on an ambitious book, and I, for the first time in a really long time, I was like, maybe I can do something ambitious and kind of out there, and so just thank you for that, but I, I do have sort of a craft question, which is, one of the things that I love that I don't think the story would have been the same is um, your sort of 360 look at the world. So you mentioned it a little bit with the observers, but um, you did so much head hopping. And yeah. I love head hopping. And I naturally incline to that. But I know that you get a lot of like, you know, people tell you don't move around. But there was this one, one chapter, and I think it was probably towards the end, where you were head hopping between Thurwar yeah. and Stax. And it got to a point where I was like, you know, I don't know, I, I, I it was very clear, so just to make, like it, I was, I knew who was, you know, whose head I was in. And that was just masterful, it was genius. And I know, and I wonder, I guess like a, from, I, I wonder whether you got pushback from that, but also I was reading it and I was like, this is, there's many reasons why the book is amazing, but for me, the yeah. reason why it was amazing was I was thinking as you were talking about the HMCs and there's this one scene, sorry, but there's one scene, I'm not spoiling, I'm, I'm not spoiling, yeah. I'm not spoiling, I'm not spoiling. There's one, H, there's one scene where the HMC is circling around a body, yeah. okay, I'll just say that. And I felt like that's sort of how the book 
felt to me. Like yeah. you were looking at this issue, but because you had hopped and because you had all these different characters, it allows you to look at the issue from like a 360 way. And I, I just, that to me was yes. just brilliant. I loved it. And also I was just wondering, yeah, like did people give you a lot of flack for it? Because it's like people really like the main character and they really yeah. like, they want the, you know, capitalist American, like, you know, and I'm sure I just curious to know yeah, how you handled that. Um, first of all, I love the form of that question. It was very congratulatory. <laughs> um, but, you know, but actually you're saying things that like I, I looked for because it, when people, when she says head hopping, I think, I don't know, people, like she's talking about like moving from a character's perspective, another person's point of view, point of view, point of view. And I do that at the end in the same chapter yeah, that's uh, with these little paragraph things. And that has to be at the end because I have to like hope that you've been trained to know the voices mm -hmm. well enough. But um, in terms of like the ambition of that kind of, and also what you said is really right on. For a long time, that's how I was describing it even to myself, like mm -hmm. the HMCs moving around mm -hmm. like outside of the chain gang. And so I think you're really right on with like your reading and I appreciate it very much. But um, in terms of like, the ambition stuff and like pushback. Luckily, no, like no, that has never happened. And I, I think that it's not like we talk about like that part of like my like personality or something. But even though like I, I'm, I, I keep it chill like in person. But like I do care to be like. Uh, I'm trying to think of like, the nicest best way of saying this. Like, I like to do things that like I don't think that everyone could just do. Hmm. You know. I like to do stuff that like see <laughs> that sound is that nice? I don't know. That was like <laughs> I like to um <laughs> but and even before I like for me it's like cuz I don't come it, it, it took me a long time and I kind of have a sense of the kind of like what I care about and how I like things to come out and I I'm the kind of reader who would read that and be like, "Yo, like they went yeah. for it." Yeah. And I rather like Basically, like, you know, Simone Biles, go for, like, the quadruple whatever. And even if you have to take a step back on your landing, I'd rather you try that mm -hmm. um, than, like, do, like, a safe one. And that's just kind of, like, my personality type. Um, so I, it means a lot to me that you felt that because, like, I tried that. And I also sort of felt that in, in the – before I even started, like, I was, like, I – to – to accomplish this book in any way successfully, I'd have to become a much better writer than I am right now. And that's to me, the, the ambition thing is not just um, ego stuff, even though that is a part of it. <laughs> and, and the ego stuff can be useful sometimes, but it's more that if I, excuse me, it's like, it's like, it's like in a video game, like you give yourself these little low level things, like you won't, your level doesn't grow fast, but if you fight like the big dragon, you get a bunch of levels. If You might lose, but if you beat it, now look. Mm. So I just think about it like that. Like I'd rather try something that I know will grow me as a writer, and maybe even as a person, um, as opposed to um, not. And in terms of pushback, I don't, I don't think so. I don't think I felt it in, like, in the writing process. I think it was more like, let's be more precise, and that's usually, if, it, if ever comes, that's how it is, which is what I need. And I don't think I even realized until probably going to Goodreads a couple times now that <laughs> <laughs> that people don't like because I I'm into that Me I'm like too. if you could do yeah. it do it so I didn't think I I would luckily mm -hmm. I was ignorant to to that even potential pushback and I think also like as the medium of a novel or fiction prose you, it's hard to get that 360 story in any other art form of art where you're like and that's for me it was like. I, I, I felt like a, so much more of a fuller picture of the story because of that like technique. Um, and I've, I've worked in the prison system. So just to say too that like that was also like I was, um, you know, I, it meant a lot that I could see like what you were doing and it, it just really resonated with me. So thank you, it means thank a you. lot to thank me, you so much. seriously. Hi. Hey. Um, before I ask my question, I wanted to say that I love this book. Thank and you so I much. also love your outfit both today and in the author photo. Just, <laughs> so you know. Just so you know. It's the green pants. I think I was wearing them same ones in the picture. Yep. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> they look like um, they're not, like, like they would be like, uh, you know what I mean, like buttony, but they're like spandexy. <laughs> Um, so my question is... I think is, I'm from, uh, from like a Buffalo exchange. I would tell you if I didn't, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, 
my question is also a little bit about your writing craft. I was wondering, like, how you write, whether your process is like to sit down every day or you write in bursts. And if it is bursts, like what inspires you? Well, if, it's, if it is what? Like in bursts. Yeah, I'm kind of, I guess both. Like when I was really, really typed in during pandemic. So I wrote this, it took me about seven years to do it, but I feel like writers always say that like it took me like a million years. But like I wasn't working every day of the seven years, you know, I was working on it when I could. But then during pandemic, I kind of like really tapped in which is hard because I was like, let me like work on this book in the off chance society doesn't collapse. I'm like <laughs> writing my little story. Then third war said, uh, it's sirens. I live in New York. It's like, you know, it's crazy. But um, when I was really, really doing my best, I had like my whole day formed around my writing. Like I would wake up, meditate, go to gym, come home, work for either a thousand words or two hours, whichever came first. Then you get to eat. And then it almost created like this really good rhythm because by the time I get to like 900 words my mouth is like watering you know and it was like just kind of create this really good rhythm and I got like fully like I could feel like my brain getting tuned to the book if that makes sense at some point I think it's really important to find like a like a that kind of routine but before that because of life I was part of it I was in grad school then I was um doing the first book stuff it was very burst it was very much like all over and um all over the place but eventually I kind of got to like a routine and probably the last uh, two-ish years, I, t mm, like, there's probably a two-year period where I was semi-consistent, but uh, it was like I was literally trapped in the house, so um, that helped with that. But for the most part, I'm I'm pretty sporadic with it. But I do try when it's, like, when it's time to go for real, like, I, I try to, like, create some type of routine. It's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought you were good. Oh, yeah, we can. All right, let's give our authors a round of applause, everybody. Thank you guys so much. Bro, thank you, man.